Jonathan Doyle is an author, speaker, an educator, and founder of the Going Deeper program, which is now in use in over 400 Catholic schools around the world. Over the past decade, he has spoken to over 300,000 people on topics related to leadership, education, and peak performance. He comes to us from Australia. Uh, I don't, by the way. Uh, and St. Louis is one of his final stops on a recent world tour of sorts, which is pretty awesome. Going Deeper is a Catholic weekly online staff formation program in Catholic identity and teaching on education. It inspires, educates, and challenges every Catholic teacher to deepen their personal faith and knowledge of Catholic teaching so they can fulfill their, our noble vocation within the great mission of Catholic education. He has a deep passion for affirming, inspiring, and encouraging Catholic educators to realize the nobility and importance of their vocation at an important moment in world history. He's also worked closely with senior executives and elite sporting teams. Jonathan holds a master's degree in leadership and management in education and is currently completing further postgraduate work at the Pontifical Institute for Studies in Marriage and Family. He is married and a father of three young children. His wife, Karen, is here in St. Louis with us. And make sure you stop by their booth in the Expo Hall to say hello. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jonathan Doyle, who will reflect with us today on finding purpose in the education vocation. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Would you do this for me, please? Would you just turn to the person next to you, look them in the eye, and say you look truly radiant with holiness today. Do that for me, please. <clears throat> I said, I said to Tom that the only way that I would come this far would be if the audience was truly radiant with holiness. You're looking fantastic. I want to thank Tom for the introduction. It was an excellent introduction. I wrote that. That was a really, really good introduction. But it was not, in fact, the single most memorable introduction I've ever had. It was very good. The most memorable introduction I've ever had walking on stage in the Philippines about five years ago. Major global conference. My wife Karen and I were there because it was a big conference on young people and relationships. And we owned a media company that was making content for young people around sex, dating and relationships. So we're just about to walk on the stage. 1,500 people in the room. The lady was there reading the introduction. She really liked Karen and I. She liked what we were doing. She started to get a little bit excited. She's reading at the lectern. She says, ladies and gentlemen, we are very lucky to have Jonathan and Karen Doyle with us today. They're amongst our foremost educators in sex. And they make their own DVDs. <laughs> and I'm on the side of the stage and I'm just like, oh dear God, no. <laughs> this is my global moment. And Karen's on the side of the stage and she's like, and you first. <laughs> so, so friends, any introduction that isn't that is good. Um, stoked to be here. I only have four hours with you now, so I do want to get started. Um, what I thought I'd do just very quickly is a lot of times at events like this, they're very formal and you get the, this is Professor blah blah and it's very serious. And I like to give you a little bit more context of who I am and why I do what I do. I always love to introduce the family quickly so you get an idea of who I am. This is uh, my wife, Karen. We've been married 16 years now? 16 years. The interesting thing is Karen, my wife, utterly refused to even date me for three years. Wouldn't even go out on a single day. Wouldn't even go out with me for three years. Why? I was in prison. No, three years. <laughs> Until she finally agreed to go on a first date. But as I used to say to young people in seminars, if you stalk some, no, if you stay committed long enough, anything's possible. So we were married, uh, 
We were desperate to start a family, but we couldn't have children for about six years, which some of you have been through that journey is very hard. And uh, eventually Karen was just diagnosed with celiac disease. Once that was diagnosed, we couldn't stop having children. Uh, we, we had three under the age of three and a half. And this is a photo that was taken uh, the year that we won Australian Family Association Award for Family of the Year, because we're perfect. On the outside is my eldest, Olivia. Inside in the middle there is the man cub, Aidan James. And outside is our youngest, Cyclone, Stephanie. They're a little bit older now. Um, they're, they're, they're here. So we brought them with us. So feel free to come up and say hello. We've got them contained at the moment, but feel free to say hello to them. If your wallet goes missing, please come and talk to us. We'll work that out. Uh, the last couple I wanted to show you just very quickly, a couple of favorites. This is a photo of my Olivia, who's actually sitting in the front row, uh, of the day that she was defending her year one cross-country title. She won the kindergarten cross-country title. She'd won the year one cross-country title. And this was the day she was defending in year two. There's a hundred kids on the start line. And Karen, she's the good parent. She stands there and she says, just go out there, darling, and just do your best. I'm about to get real, right? I'm just standing, I said, Remember what Dad always says, darling, if you don't win, you can't come home. <laughs> so she won. And she got to come home this year. There's always next year. All right. And the last one I want to show you very quickly, every family has one of these. This is our youngest child, Stephanie, photobombing my brother's wedding. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait, there's more. Thank you so much. See you next year. Thank you. Right. No. Okay. Uh, what I'd love to do with you very quickly is I'd love to give you a quick roadmap. Karen said it's a really good idea to always show people where you're going. Uh, I want to really just give you a quick sense of what I'm going to do to you, do with you this afternoon. Uh, the first thing is uh, I want to talk a little bit with you about the concept of owning purpose, which you can see here up on the screen. I originally titled this uh, Finding and, Own and Owning Purpose, but I figure if you're here, if you came here, you already have at least some sense of what you're doing in life, so I changed it to simply Owning Purpose. I passionately believe that if we can really not just have some sense of purpose, but, but really own our purpose, really feel that what you're doing is significant, that you were meant to do it, that there's a reason that you're here, that if you do that, two things tend to happen. One, if I could be pragmatic, is you tend to enjoy your life a little bit more. I mean, so many people spend their life doing things they don't want to do. But if you know why you're here, you tend to be happier and you enjoy your life more. And I want that to happen for you. Secondly, when you own your purpose, it's much easy for, easier for you to participate and, and to work with the purposes of God when you really know why you're here. So I want to talk a little bit about that very much, just, just quickly at the start. Then I want to share with you why it's hard to find and really own and live purpose. So my experience over the last decade working with tens of thousands of teachers around the world was a constant exposure to cynicism and burnout and people leaving the profession and teachers feeling isolated. And, and why is it hard to live that purpose? Friends, I humbly believe I have the answer, and I'm going to show you that in this, in this second section. I want to show you something that I think is the one predominant cause of why teachers burn out, of why cynicism can drag you down, of why you sometimes feel it's too much and that no one knows how hard it is for you. I want to show you what that thing is. It's good news. And then I want to finish by just talking about what we can do. An American entrepreneur has a, a concept that I really like. It's called clouds and dirt. Clouds are the macro big picture things. I want to give you some, some top level cloud thinking today, some stuff that you can use as a really useful filter so you can go back to your work and remember these cloud level macro things, the big issues that are playing out in Catholic education. I want you to know them. There's things I think that some of you aren't aware are happening that will really surprise you. And then we're going to finish by getting down in the dirt. I want to give you six practical things. I think it is rude to come all this distance to your country, provide a little bit of entertainment, and then leave without giving you something you can actually do. 
and I really want to give you that at the end. I can't make you do them, of course I can't. But if you do these things, you will see transformation in your own vocation and you'll see it in your school community. Uh, so when we get practical, I just do want to say to every man in the room, you will not be required at any point to hug a stranger and you won't be required to share your feelings. Because in Australia, the presenter gets up, sometimes I'm sitting there and the presenter's like, we're going to get out of our comfort zones. And I'm like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> They're so comfortable. And the, the, you know, the speaker's like, we're going to do an activity. I'm like, no, you're going to do an activity. So friends, don't be afraid. I'm just going to give you some really useful stuff. So you ready? Yes. All right, let's do this. Friends, let's talk a little bit about owning our purpose in Catholic education. This is really good stuff. And to, to, to show you what I feel about this and why it's on my heart, I want to show you four quick photographs to give it some context. Here's the first one. This is what I refer to as the people responsible. <laughs> this is my parents, <laughs> married 44 years. And this next photograph was taken two days before my father died. And this is my father's grave. Why would I show that to you? My father grew up in England after the Second World War, or during the Second World War, to a very wealthy construction family that made a lot of money in the rebuilding phase after the Second World War. He had a pretty difficult childhood. It wasn't easy. When he was a young teenager, his father, who you can see on the next slide, died horrifically in front of him. That's my grandfather. I never met him. He died 30-odd years before I was born. And that's my father as a young boy. A week after my grandfather died in my father's arms, they shipped him off to boarding school where he was brutalised for years. And when he came back, he was forced into the family construction business, which he hated with an incredible passion. And then he spent the rest of his life doing something he fundamentally hated. He was a man, God rest him, who lived his entire life outside any deep sense of purpose and it drove him into a deep and lifelong depression. My memories of my own childhood is of seeing dad sort of disappear for two or three days at a time, and we'd find him eventually in his room just staring at the ceiling. My father should have been an artist or, or something highly creative, but he didn't. He spent his life doing something he hated. And as I began to prepare to come to be with you, I realised that the whole path of my life in many ways has just been a response to seeing somebody live outside of purpose. And I don't want that for you. And as I began to prepare, I said, I asked God to help me. I said, what's my DNA? What's my core essence here that I want to share with you early about your purpose? And I want to suggest to you two things. And I pray that you'll take as many notes as you can. Thomas Aquinas beautifully said that the hand is the conjoined instrument of the mind. Please, I'm going to give you some key lines today. And here's the first thing. I just want to say to you about purpose. It is no accident that you are a Catholic teacher. I often say to people, please stop thinking that you chose teaching. Please understand that teaching chose you. Or that the God who ordained us to be teachers chose you. And I want to give you a scriptural basis for that now, very quickly. Ephesians 4.11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Friends, we have a clear scriptural basis that Almighty God, He who flings galaxies from His fingertips, cared enough about you and knew, and knew enough about you personally to know where your gifts and charisms in this life would flourish. He wanted some of us to be teachers. It is no accident that you are a teacher. On your hardest day, you've got to hold on to this. It's no accident. And he who called you is faithful. And if you've been called into it, he will sustain you in it. And we're going to talk about that as we go. 
I often teach a day seminar on this concept of vocation, of course, coming from the, from the Latin vocare. All of you should know this, of course, to draw out, to call out, to draw out, to draw forth, that the Holy Spirit called out of you, drew out of you these charisms and gifts. So the first thing I offer you around owning purpose, friends, the God that holds the cosmos together is so specifically interested in you that he wanted you to do this. And the second thing is to give you a, the scripture from Jeremiah was on my heart for you, where, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future to prosper you and not to harm you. Friends, if you're taking notes, think of it this way. I like, I like to say this, it's like this. You have no idea what you're capable of. You have no idea what you're capable of. He's not done with you yet. As you really begin to understand the message I want to share with you today, you have no idea what's ahead, what he can do with you, what he can do with you. I'd like to share with you very quickly some beautiful lines just from, people love these. These are from John Baptiste de La Salle. Share these all over the world. They're beautiful words that this great founder would say to his own teacher. So feel free to photograph the screen because I want these to, to permeate, right? I want you to get these down. I want you to hear them spoken into your spirit. And then I want you to hold on to them. And I want you to start to believe with me that these are real things. Here's what the great John Baptiste de La Salle used to say to his teachers. God has given you so many graces. God has chosen you to do his work. Let that sink in chosen. God has chosen you to make him known to others. We are called like the apostles to make God known to others. As I was preparing this talk, I thought, look, God's God, right? God can do whatever he wants. God can physically manifest in your classroom next week. The beatific glory can suddenly manifest in your classroom. It could happen. If it doesn't, how will young people experience God? This next one is very popular all over the world. People tweet this, they love it. It's very beautiful. He said to his teachers, young people need good teachers like visible angels. Isn't that a beautiful line? That young people need that? I mean, do you jump up Monday morning, race out of the shower and go, oh, honey, quick, grab me a coffee. I've got, I've got to go. The kids need some visible angels. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the person in your house is like, yeah, here's your coffee. Get your wings. Off you go. But friends, in a world that's dark, so much of what's on the internet, so much of what they're exposed to, there's so much darkness. They need visible angels. God has called you to your ministry. I love this last one. God entrusts to you his care of the young. He takes this precious gift, knowing that you could handle it, and he hands it to you. Now, I know it doesn't feel like that on the last Friday of term time. But what a beautiful thing if, if we begin to reframe for that. All right, friends, the last thing I want to give you is something I really love to do. If we had time and I had a smaller group, I do this really cool activity. It's trivia. And I say to the audience, without using a handheld device, does anyone know which film won the 1965 Academy Award for Best Picture? And once I did this with an audience and this young teacher, they're so excited, they're like, pick me, pick me. Their hand goes up and I said, yes. And they went, Rambo. And I'm like... Sweet child, no, no. I could destroy you right now, but I'm just not going to. Friends, the film that won the 1965 Academy Award, do not go to your deathbed if you haven't seen it. It's based on the phenomenal play written by Thomas Beckett. It was performed on Broadway, based on the life of St. Thomas More. It is, of course, the brilliant film, A Man for All Seasons, based on the life of St. Thomas More, who, of course, refused to grant Henry VIII his divorce. Why would I be showing this to you? Because there is a scene at the start of that movie that is so powerful. St. Thomas More is standing on the banks of the Thames, and he's talking to a young man called Richard Rich. Richard eventually, of course, betrays him. What does Richard Rich do? He's a teacher. And because Henry VIII is yet to declare himself supreme head of the church in England, he must be a Catholic teacher. And he's in teaching in the court of Henry VIII. 
he's tutoring students and he's just a teacher in Henry VIII's court, but he wants something else. He wants to get in on the power games of Henry VIII's court. He wants to be seen and noticed and promoted and get in on all the intrigues. And he's talking to St. Thomas More as a mentor and there's a moment where he stops and St. Thomas More says these words, Rich, Rich, you're a teacher. Why not be a great one? And Richard Rich pauses, looks down, and then looks up at him and says this. But who would know? St. Thomas More pauses and says, your students, your friends, your parents, God, not a bad audience that rich, not a bad audience. My friends, if you were going to be a Catholic teacher, why not be a great one? Part two. Why is it so hard to do? Why is it so hard to do? Why do so many people leave? Why is there cynicism and exhaustion and burnout at times? And I know that's not all of us. I want to help you understand this with a powerful, simple story. Friends, we all have obsessions. We all have obsessions. Mine just happen to be very expensive ones. Harley Davidson's golf and road cycling. I became passionate about road cycling many years ago. It's been a great joy for me. I ride at an elite level. I do a huge amount of training. It's a great source of joy. Several, about two years ago, I had a 247 kilometer race. In that 247 kilometer race, there were three major climbs. Every time I tell the story, they get a little steeper. So I get up the morning of this ride and I'm really excited and I've got this new special electrolyte carbohydrate solution. I load up my two water bottles, I've got all my stuff. I take off on this ride. I was super fit, everything was going well. First 100 kilometers, no problems. We get to the first major climb of the day, this. I start going up the climb. Halfway up, I'm thinking this is much harder than it should be. Why is this so hard? I was fit and I suddenly realized I hadn't changed the climbing cassette on the bike. I, was, I had a flat racing cassette on instead of a climbing cassette, so my gearing ratios were the wrong ones. It was twice as hard as it should have been. I somehow made it through over the top of this first climb. I was drinking all this electrolyte solution. Get over the top of the climb. Get to the first food stop. Was really hungry. Ate the food stop. All of it. Go down the hill. Another 50, 60 kilometers in. Come to the second climb of the day. This one's steeper. Mountain goats. People with nosebleeds. I'm, I've got this gearing ratio that's really problematic and I'm suffering and I'm feeling terrible and I'm finally, I get to this climb, I get down the other side, I'm about 200 kilometers in, I get to the last climb of the day and I'm feeling so sick. I felt really nauseous and so unwell. I get to the base of the third climb and I am a death before dishonor kind of guy. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that would prefer to die on the bike, get home that afternoon, you know, Karen, the kids would be like, where's dad? Oh, he died. <laughs> kids would be like, hmm. Oh. What's for dinner? Okay, um, I get to the base of this third climb and I'm feeling so unwell. I get off the bike, I've never got off the bike ever. And right at the moment I face this huge existential question. What do I do? My values, mental toughness, what does it mean to be a man? So right at that moment I knew I faced a choice point and I did what any real man in my situation would do. I pulled out my phone, called Karen and said, please pick me up. <laughs> I'd, never fin I'd never not finished a ride before. Why am I telling you? Because in the week that followed, I really debriefed what had happened and it came down to two things. And I want you to remember these. They're very useful. I realized that I had the wrong climbing cassette. I had the wrong tools. But much more important, because of this electrolyte solution, aggravated the linings at the stomach wall lining, couldn't get the food in, ate the wrong stuff. I had the wrong tools and the wrong fuels. And I realized that day that if you have an important goal, a mission, a, a purpose, but you have the wrong tools and the wrong fuels, it's very hard to accomplish. Friends, I don't think tools are our problem in Catholic education. I know some of you think, well, we need more tech and we need more of this. I get it. But friends, when it comes to pedagogy, curriculum, you can always find this stuff. Many of you are brilliant at this. You network, you talk to each other. The pedagogy, the curriculum stuff, it's always available. I humbly offer that our real problem isn't tools. My thesis is this, that the real challenge we face in Catholic education is not one of tools, it's one of fuels. 
And I want you to remember this one thing. It's what I'm teaching all over the world. It's the central thesis that I have. Here it comes. Please get this down. You cannot do a supernatural task with only natural resources. All over the world, I kept seeing this fatigue and these issues and problems, and I kept thinking, we have huge numbers of people of good will, really good will people out there every day trying to make a huge difference, but many of them, through no fault of their own, are trying to do a supernatural task with natural resources. And friends, if that was going to work, it would have worked by now. And to, to show you that these aren't just my pet theories, I always try and give it a scriptural basis. My friends, John 15, chapter 5. John 15, chapter 5. Jesus makes it ridiculously clear. He simply says to us this, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you notice that Jesus never said, apart from me, you will be moderately effective? He never said to me, apart from me, many of your students will probably graduate. And I love this because sometimes people are going, well, you know, Jesus was being metaphorical. Where's the metaphor? In apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, I am the vine. And if we don't stay in the vine, he says, we wither and we die. And they are, those branches are collected up into a pile. They're thrown into the furnace, Jesus says, where they are burned up. Or as I like to say, where they burn out. We cannot do a supernatural task with natural resources. And the other tagline I often put with this is a really simple one. You cannot give what you do not possess. We cannot give what we don't have. I am so excited for some people here that we're going to understand what this really means today and this will be a day of big change. So friends, how are we going to fix it? I'm really positive that there's something we can do and there's two things. I'm going to give you two things in the clouds and then we're going to the dirt. I want to give you these two filters. The first one, for those taking notes, you must understand the story that you're really in. If you don't understand the story that you're really in, you can't be truly effective. Here's one example. If you're in a story that says you have a job, that's a different story to I am partnering with Almighty God in the redemption of the world. They're two different stories. But they're not quite the stories I want to talk about. I want to talk about two stories. I want to give you two quotes. I want to talk about the story that I believe everyone in this room, from the bishop to the people at the very back of the room, we're all in this story. And I want to give you two quotes, both from C.S. Lewis, about the story we're really in. One, C.S. Lewis said this, God claims every square inch of the universe and Satan counterclaims it. God claims every square inch of the universe and Satan counterclaims it. And the second one, C.S. Lewis said, the incarnation is nothing other than a daring raid on enemy-held territory. Why would I share that with you? Because I believe that God is trying to tell a story through Catholic education. He's trying to tell it through your classroom, through your classroom and your classroom and yours and in the back row and the left to the right. He is trying to tell a story. What is the story he is trying to tell? There's only ever been one story. It's the same story of why Jesus came, come home, come home, come home to the Father. It's okay, come home. There's only one story. There aren't 15. There's one story, come home. He's trying to tell other stories, that, people, that students have dignity and value and 
worth because they are made in the image and likeness of Almighty God. He's trying to tell the story of forgiveness. He's trying to tell young people that they're more than what they look like, they're more than what they own, and they're more than their postcode, and they're more than the generational poverty they may have come from. He is trying to speak that story through your classroom, through you. But the enemy of God, the eternal enemy, the one Jesus said, so he saw like fall like lightning from heaven, the father of lies who was a murderer from the beginning, and when he lies, he speaks his own native tongue. He is trying to tell another story through your classroom. You know that kid trapped in generational poverty? Satan is trying to tell a different story. You're stuck there. You belong there. That's your identity. That's where you live. You know that dyslexic kid in the third grade? He's trying to tell that kid a story. You'll never transcend this. Everyone laughs at you. You'll never be any good. You know that girl in your high school that cuts herself every night? He's trying to tell her a story going, everyone hates you. You'll never be good enough for anybody. You can't be loved. (sighs) Satan can never win any final battle. This is important. People go, can you just give us practical stuff? No, because this is the real story. He can never win any final battle. That battle was lost on Calvary. But please understand today, there is one thing and only one story he has and one game he has to separate as many individual human persons as possible from relationship with God. We have to understand the real story we're in. You're not just teaching, you are fighting. John Paul II beautifully said this, if you're taking notes, John Paul II said, we are engaged in the front lines of a lively battle for the dignity of the person. You're not teaching, friends. You're doing much more than that. And you should go to sleep each night knowing that what you're doing matters and that it's significant and there will come a day when you will be shown exactly what was really happening and the part that you played and it matters. So friends, first thing we must know, the story we're really in. And here's the second thing. It's incredibly simple, but it's not easy. It's incredibly simple, but not easy. Ready? Here's what I need you to do. I need everybody in the room, from the bishop to the back, to do this. I just need you to become a saint. (laughs) Wrong response. All over the world, that's what happens. And it's interesting that that's what happens. Friends, let's do this quickly. The first thing is we have all these associations. There's a factory in heaven. God makes these saints. They come out of a special factory. They roll off an assembly line. They land in cribs like this. They say thou a great deal. They don't have much fun and they end up in stained glass windows. And I don't blame you. I don't blame you for not wanting that. When I stand in front of you and say, let's be saints, you're like, yay, let's be saints. (laughs) What time's the bar open? All right. All right, let me mess with it a little bit very quickly. Friends, to be a saint, I think, just means two things. I'm not a theologian, so don't don't come and see me afterwards, but two things. Here's what happened with the saints. They just encountered God, and they were done. They just encountered him and went, oh. And they never wanted anything else. And they just wanted to be with him, with him. Where he was, he, they wanted to be there. That's what it was. They just wanted him. Saints just want to be with God. And the second thing, I think saints just become fully who they are. Most of us in this room, because of the wounds that we've had in life, we're all running defense patterns of some kind. We've all got wounds and we're all carrying stuff. When you become a saint, you just trust and stuff falls away and you become the real you. So if you don't want to be a saint, I've just got to ask you this. How much of your life do you want to spend not being the real you? It's exhausting. Before the Second Vatican Council, there was a heresy in the air. People thought saints was like an airline frequent loyalty program, right? That you couldn't be a saint unless you're at least Monsignor above. It's the only chance you had of getting upgraded, okay? It was a heresy. Second Vatican Council, there was a really cool thing that was promulgated called the universal call to holiness, which meant that every one of us, there's a beautiful line in the documents of the Second Vatican Council that simply says, all the lay faithful are called to sanctity of life, all of us. In one archbishop's recent book that I read on the flight over, he simply said, friends, buildings, programs, it ain't going to do it. The only thing that's going to do it is saints. Friends, the only thing that has ever done it is saints. The only thing that has ever transformed the world, changed the church, rebuilt her, has been saints. We need more. Can you think for a second what would happen to this nation if 8,000 saints just were just birthed out of this place? Seriously, I'm serious, and you know I am. You can tell in my voice tone that I'm serious. We are called to be saints. How is God doing this? I'm going to be respectful of time, so I'm pushing now. So stay with me and take as many notes as you can. 
God's going to make you a saint through two things, your primary vocation and your secondary vocation. Married life, religious life, he's going to make you a saint through that. I often say marriage will make you a saint or it'll kill you. <laughs> Friends, I've just done seven weeks with three children under nine in hotel rooms. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I can, I can levitate now. Um, but I want to talk to you about this. Do you know the other place God wants to make you a saint? Through your vocation. Do you know that? Do you know that? Has anyone ever told you that? What you think is your work is God coming to you, as one saint said, God comes to you disguised as your life. You know that difficult person I often used to say, think of that staff member in your faculty you like the least. And the whole people are like, "Uh uh-huh. And God's there going, hey, you want to grow a little? I got something for you. Through all the challenges and the trials and the difficulties of your vocation, God is trying to make you a saint. So I want to give you a massive reframe today about what he's actually doing in your work. And for those of you still thinking, Jonathan, this is a lovely idea. It's very nice. But for anyone here thinking that you're going to leave and not take this seriously because you're not buying what I'm selling because you still think that there's different people out there to be saints, I want to share with you something very special to me that's been really changing my life. Most of you will not recognize the face. A small number of you will. Around the world, no one does. Even less of you will probably know the name. This, of course, is Solanus Casey, born in Detroit in November of 1870. One of 11 children, he was born Barney Casey. Really struggled at school, left school when he was 14 years of age, became an itinerant labourer, ditch digger, tram conductor and prison guard, led a really dissolute life. Uh, he, He was out one night drinking and he saw a sailor stab this young woman and he was traumatized and had a kind of religious sort of revival. He went into the diocesan seminary in Detroit, but he was so intellectually limited that he couldn't do the Greek, the Latin, or the German texts. He really struggled with the texts. After six years, they kicked him out. They just said, we can't help him, sorry, but we can't. He was heartbroken. He wandered uh, for several more years as an itinerant laborer, and eventually, God bless them, the Franciscans took pity on him. And they took him into the Franciscan seminary, and they sat with him, and they worked with him, and after many more years, he finally graduated their seminary. But he was so limited, they only allowed him to become what's called a simplex priest. He couldn't hear confessions, and he wasn't allowed to, to preach public homilies. It's the church's way of going, look, you've kind of got a vocation, but we need to keep you away from the general public. So I want you to feel this with me. See this story. Solanus Casey, the Franciscans bring him back to their chapter house in Detroit. They bring him up to the big front door and they're making this up as they go. They're like, what are we actually going to do with this guy? They bring him through the big front door and they just go, look, there's a little room just off the side. And they say, Solanus, look, just sit in this room. And um, when the doorbell rings, uh, just get up, answer the door. And and then whoever they need to see, get them to sit down. Then go and find the important people they need to see and bring them back. And then you just sit with them and just maybe talk to them if you have to and just sit there. And he said, okay. And then he sits there for two hours. Nothing happens. And then the doorbell rings and he gets up and he opens the door and he welcomes these people in and he sits them in the room and then he goes to get the important people they need to see and then he comes back and sits with them. And then they go and about an hour later the doorbell rings again. He goes and answers the door. And Solanus Casey got up and answered the door every time it rang seven days a week for 22 years. But during those 22 years, something began to happen. He was given a supernatural insight into the deepest needs of people's hearts. He ended up sitting with people and he was given supernatural insight into these deep needs that no one knew about. And he would say to them, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but I have a deep sense that you need prayer for X. And they would sob because no one had known about it. And he would pray with them. And then miracles began to happen. And couples that couldn't conceive children, he would pray with them and they began to conceive. And then miracles happened. And then he was allowed to preach once a week. And a revival began. And people got healed. And all he did was keep opening the door. And when he died, he's already 
venerable Solanus Casey with his case progressing and before you can blink friends he will be Saint Solanus Casey and here's my question for you if God can make a saint out of a semi-literate, ditch-digging, prison-guarding, tram-conducting Franciscan that all he ever did was open a door, do you have any idea what he could do through you? I am serious. You think no one sees. You think no one sees when you crouch down to that child's eye line. There will be a day when you will be, people will see that. They will be shown it. Everything matters. And we have to stop thinking that we can't want that and desire to be like that, to become, he just became who he really was. And there's a beautiful story told by Benedict Groeschel, the famous priest, one, many, many years ago, he was traveling and he ended up at the same house and he couldn't sleep and he got up at 2 a.m. and he walked around a bit and he walked down to the chapel, pitch black, flicked on the light switch and at 2 a.m. in the morning, kneeling down right in front of the Blessed Sacrament was Solanus Casey. Didn't flinch. And Benedict Groeschel just turned the light off and left. Do you think Solanus might have understood that you cannot do a supernatural task with only natural resources? Did you think Solanus maybe understood that apart from Jesus, he could do nothing? Let's finish. Just quickly, a priest in London said to me a few weeks ago, he said, Jonathan, when you talk to teachers about this saint stuff, Make sure you tell them the words of St. Ambrose. And I said, which ones? He said to me, Jonathan, you've got to tell them, a saint is someone who falls a hundred times and rises a hundred and one. The minute you set your foot to this, the minute you begin to think about this, that you might really become sanctified through your work, your faults and your failings and your failures will come up in HD. And you'll snap at that colleague, or you'll say that thing to the student, or you'll lose hope, and you'll go, Saint, yeah, I'll never be. One more time, one more time, one more time. Just keep going. He's faithful. You're meant to be saints. I'm really serious. I want to finish with this. Let's take you to the dirt. I wanted to give you six incredibly practical things to finish things that I pray you will photo, or not, I'm not going to have them on the screen, you'll write down, you'll take them away, you'll listen to this again, six things. If you do these, your life will change. I can't make anyone do them, but if you do them, your life will change, your vocation will flourish, and you will partner with God in changing the world, and that's a good deal. Here they are, number one, to deeply own and live your purpose, become a saint and change the world, one, the way is a person. The way is not a program, a system, or some kind of undertaking. Ready? The way is a person. Number two. This has really been on my heart. I think I've come up with this, so at least I'm framing it this way. The path of dependence. It took me 43 years to learn. I was the most goal-driven, muscle my way through life, force my way along the path. And it's taken me till about 43 to finally go, I am not smart enough, good enough. I have slowly learned to completely just go, become dependent. You know that class that you're afraid of teaching? You know that student that you can't reach? Just say, I'm done. Help me. I'm done. Become truly dependent. It's a really complete inversion of our lives. There's a beautiful favorite quote I have from Abraham Lincoln. It's very beautiful. Listen to what Lincoln said. I have been driven to my knees more times than I can possibly remember by the overwhelming awareness that I had nowhere left to go. Become dependent, truly dependent. Trust him. The way is a person, set your foot on the path of dependence in every area of your life. It's terrifying. But friends, just listen, take it from me. Some of us have done this, right? We've spent the rest, the, most of our lives trying to figure it out ourselves and muscle our way through. Let's just stop. It's a huge leap of faith. Number three. 
Can I invite all of us to return deeply into the heart of the church and her sacraments? I don't have much else for you. Come back to the sacraments. He is there. And where he is, there's grace. I'm not some retrograde arch conservative. I just know that where he is, I want to be. And the Catechism teaches us that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the faith. It is the source from which our faith flows and it is the summit to which it leads us. Friends, if you want to grow, if you want to find your vocation and really live it, go to the source. Come back to the heart of the church and her sacraments. Joan of Arc, shortly before her death, beautifully said, of this I am certain, Jesus Christ and his church are one and the same thing, and we must not complicate the matter. Come home. I know so many of you already do, but go deeper. Seek him in the sacraments. If you track me around the world for the last seven weeks, it's hilarious. I kept pulling Google Maps, running through car parks, trying to find where mass was on in Iceland. Uh, in Washington, I thought I was going to get shot because I was running through a police car park. Just like I was trying to get away from something because I was late. And I'm going, where's the church? Am I holy? No. I just wanted to be where he was because I can't be the husband or father or anything that he wants me to be if I can't be with him find him in the heart of the church and the sacraments for prayer we must become people of prayer i'm really serious peter kreeft says lack of prayer is the cause of lack of time we must seek him in prayer there's a beautiful reading just a few weeks ago where moses is on the mountain with god and god's about to wipe out the israelites and he says to moses these are a stiff-necked people and Moses turns to God and says, God, if you do this, the, Israel, the Egyptians will say, all you did was bring us out here to kill us. And he turns the heart of God with his heartfelt prayer. Friends, would you start praying for your students harder? Pray for your principals, pray for your priests, pray for your bishops, pray for... Pray. Pray, become real prayer. I say to teachers all over the world, you must learn to fight on your knees. Fight. Become people of prayer. And as the beautiful quote goes, pray as you can, not as you can't. You've got to be with him. Number one, the way as a person. Number two, the path of dependence. Three, seek him in the heart of the church and the sacraments. Four, prayer. Two to go, very fast. Scripture. Give him five or ten minutes of the day. Catholic teachers must become people of Scripture. You must. Just five or ten minutes a day. Get an app on your phone. He speaks. He speaks. He speaks. I can promise you from experience, he is speaking still. I was in Dubai just a few weeks ago. I was jet lagged, had the kids. I was going down a massive escalator. I was exhausted. It was hot. And, and, and I was just desperate for the sense of God's presence. And I was praying, going, Lord, I just need to know. I can't sense your presence here in this city. I can't find you. And I was going down this escalator, and I reached into my pocket, holding a child, flipped open the app, and my eyes fell on the reading of the day, and the exact words were, my son, you are with me always. I'm just like, nice. <laughs> he speaks. Will you let him speak to you? Let him speak to you. Just give him five or ten minutes a day and he will change your vocation. He speaks. And finally, the last thing, God really told me to tell you this. Community. You've got to stick together. You've got to stick together. Satan desires to pick you off one by one. He desires to pick you off one by one. He will have you in a classroom thinking no one else knows how hard it is. No one else cares. This is too tired. No, I'm not appreciated by this. And he will whisper and he will speak. But if you get together with a few other people and you begin to pray and you begin to encourage and support each other, you'll see good things happen. Don't let yourself be taken out on your own. Community, let me finish with this. I really prayed. I said, God, tell me what you want me to say to them to finish. And he put this on my heart. I was in Iceland a few weeks ago. I got to Mass each day. My Icelandic isn't very good. But you figure out when to sit and stand. And there's this, they do their homilies in English. Uh, go figure. And here's what I want to finish with. The priest gets up to do a homily, and Karen and I were really touched by it. He looked out at us, and he said this. We are dying. You are dying. He said, your time here is coming to an end. You are dying. And it really touched us, and I wanted to say two things to you. One, in the time that you have left, would you please do all the good that you can would you please do all the good that you can 
for each young person because we forget that our time is short. Do all the good that you can. And the last thing I wanted to say was that when your time does end, my prayer for you is this. First, that when you open your eyes, you'll be surrounded by everyone that you have ever loved. And the second thing, my prayer for you will be that because of all that you have done to serve and love his young people in the heart of Catholic education, my prayer for every one of you here is that the next voice you hear will say, well done, good and faithful servants. Come and enter into your master's happiness. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your vocation, for your vocation. Thank you, God bless. Thank you. Thank you.